Well, good morning. It is so good to see you. I'm thrilled that you're here. A couple of things I want you to know. Today's a little different, and it's going to be, I think, meaningful for some of you. Here's something I very often hear. Brad, how did you know what I needed when I came to church this morning? Like, have you been reading my emails? Have you been listening in on my phone calls? And the answer is yes. I have friends in the NSA. They feed me information. I write my sermons. You know how that happens? Let me tell you how that really happens. We all have life in common. We all have common hopes and dreams. I mean, there are parts of us that are different, but there are parts of us that are common. And as I'm kind of assessing my own life and needs, and then I have conversations with a lot of you through the week, and I listen to what you're saying, and I realize I'm hearing a theme, and then I tend to build sermon series, teaching series around the things that are real in my life and the things that I hear are real in your life. And then what happens is we realize it's real in a lot of people's lives. That's why when you come in, it's like, wow, I just really needed that because you and others are also feeling those very same things. Now today, it's going to be even more specific. I used to do this twice a year when the church first started because we're a unique church in that We have a lot of people who are in our church who didn't grow up in church. A lot of people in our church, they didn't grow up in Sunday school, learning Bible stories or basic, you know, knowledge about Jesus or God or the Bible or even how churches function and operate and all of that. And so I'd have these Q&As and it gave people a chance to say, this is where I'm itching and I'd have a chance to scratch it right there in the room. Does that make sense? And so we do that about twice a year. Then it got to once a year. So I was thinking, gosh, it seems like a little while since we've done that. Probably be a good time to do it. I'm going to start a new series next week that's going to go for a couple of months. The end of summer series starts next week. I'll tell you about that later. But I thought, wow, it's been a while. And so Bob went back in our archives to see when was the last time we did a Q&A. 2019. Like we had a pandemic in there, we, you know, we, we've been busy, we've been busy people, so it was time to do it. Now, if you came in after the announcement or you didn't hear the announcement, first of all, maybe you didn't get an index card and you'll want one. So if you didn't get an index card, would you raise your hand and someone will bring you a card? If you don't have a card, you'll want one. The second thing is, these are completely anonymous, which means you get to ask questions knowing that it's safe. If you put your name on it, I'm going to read your name. So go ahead, just keep them anonymous. But then you can ask whatever you want. Like, ask about the church. Ask about your pastor. Ask about Jesus. Ask about the Bible. Like, what are the things you wish somebody would have taught you or told you or you're curious about in your life, especially related to faith? Now, this is not, let's see if we can stump the pastor, you know? (laughs) That's not hard. That's not a high bar. So you really wouldn't have accomplished anything there. Somebody asked me, Brad, do you get nervous doing this? And the answer is no, and I'll tell you why. Because I have no problem saying, I don't know. I just go on to the next question. And if that was your question, it's like, well, that didn't help me. And yeah, me either. So then we go on to the next question. So that's That's how we're going to do it. So if you've already written some questions down, let's get started. Pass them to these two aisles. Just pass them to these two aisles, and uh, and they'll start coming in. These are the announcements I need to make at the end. That's what that's what that's uh, that's what those are. So we'll get started now. I usually lose track of time, and we usually have way more questions than I can get answered in a service. If anything is you know vaguely similar to something else that. Uh, that I've answered, then, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I won't repeat. I won't duplicate, all right? So go ahead and bring me a couple, uh, Pam, and then I'll get started. And Marty, thank you so, so much. Oh, gosh, we've got a bunch. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Oh, my goodness. If they come in late, if they come in late, uh, they'll go on the top, and I'll know who they are. <laughs> no, I, I shuffle them like a duck. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's just start. Here we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Do you believe the Bible is the inerrant Word of God? So there's two parts to this question, really. Do I believe and does our church believe the inerrant Word of God? In other words, that the Bible is completely true. I had a mentor. When I was a pastor and I was 20 years old, my mentor was 85. 
He was an older pastor, and his name was uh, Herschel Hobbs, Dr. Herschel Hobbs. And I said, Dr. Hobbs, do you believe the Bible's true? He said, Brad, I believe it's true from the book of contents to the book of maps. Like in old Bibles, you have the contents in the front, you have maps in the end. He said, I believe it's all true. Here's what I believe is true. Everything God wants us to know about Jesus, how we have a relationship with him, how we connect to God, and how we are intended to live our lives has been transmitted through the years truthfully. I believe that. I don't believe the Bible's supposed to be a book of science. I don't believe that the Bible's supposed to be, you know, all the things we should ever know about physics or those kinds of things. You know, some of that's outside the scope of the Bible. The Bible is who God is, how he feels about you, which is love, by the way, why we are far from him and we feel a spiritual disconnect, what he did in Christ to bring us back to him, and how we can have a vibrant, personal, daily relationship with Jesus. In the Bible, that unerring message is perfect. I'll give you one quick example. In the, I think it was in the 1950s, uh, we found what are called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Anybody heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Okay, Dead Sea Scrolls. Because here's, here's kind of slam on the Bible. Slam on the Bible is surely after all this time. I mean, people are writing it down. They didn't have you know, computers, they didn't have printers. Like, how do we know things didn't get changed, right, over time? Because they're hand copying. Maybe some scribe wanted to add something. Or maybe some scribe didn't like a part of it and wanted to take some of it out. How do we know it's accurate? So, you know, that was like a critique of the Bible. Like, obviously, over 2,000 years, it's been changed. We don't know that that's what, you know, God wants us to know. So they find the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have, in essence, the whole book of Isaiah. That's just a part of the scrolls. Whole book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. Oh, we're going to be here till Jesus comes. <laughs> Do I believe Jesus is going to come? Yeah, but not before I get through these. So uh, anyway, anyway, so you got the whole book of Isaiah. We got the whole book of Isaiah, like from these ancient scrolls. So they're like, okay, now we're going to see. The, the Isaiah we have now is going to be vastly different than these ancient scrolls. Guess what they found? Exactly the same. Exactly the same. The reliability of the Bible has been proven over and over again. There are things in the Bible that archaeologists hadn't discovered, historians hadn't discovered, geologists hadn't discovered, and then science caught up to, and it's like, oh, the only document in the world that talked about this world leader was the Bible until archaeology found like, you know, a stone with that leader's name written on it. And oh, lo and behold, he did exist. And the Bible was the only thing that ever talked about it before. Does this make sense to you? So yeah, a lot of reliability there. Okay. How do you find someone as, how did you find someone as cool as Karen? <laughs> <laughs> That, that was your handwriting, honey. I, I recognize that. God said, I'm going to give you the greatest blessing. And he brought her to me. That's how that happened. <laughs> What's the airspeed velocity, velocity of an unladen swallow? And then there's a real question. <laughs> Are there any plans underway for women's Labor Day retreats uh, and meals, uh, meals for Eight type of events? Yes, there are plans for women's retreats uh, coming. It won't necessarily be Labor Day, but yes, for women's retreats. So that's a yes. And we used to do this thing called Dinners for Eight in the summer where we would have people sign up, say, I'd like to be a part of a Dinner for Eight. We would draw eight random names, put you together, you'd have a potluck, and you'd meet new people in the church. And it was super fun. We did it for several years. But what we noticed is over the years, it started going down, 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 down. A couple new leaders took it over, and it, it, they just could not get life back into it. We said, you know, things run their course, and there didn't seem to be the interest a couple years later that there was initially. So we thought, let that lie for a while and maybe bring it back. If it's in your heart to lead it, let me know. Are cats going to be in heaven? Of course not. 
The movie isn't all cats go to heaven. <laughs> Have you seen the musical Cats? No, I'm allergic. Uh, gosh, I just can't even believe it. Can we, oh, can we bring back dinner for eight? And I think I answered that. Thank you. Uh, will Donna be holding a women's Bible study soon? Uh, people love women's Bible studies. Y- yes, the answer is yes. Donna's back there. And will we have a women's retreat? I'm hearing a theme. What makes non-Christians skeptical about Christianity? Christians make non-Christians skeptical about Christianity. What happens in the book of Revelation in a nutshell? (laughs) Well, that's easy. (laughs) Jesus comes back. If I'm skipping them, it's not because they're bad. It's just more cat jokes. Uh, Elaborate on the Trinity. Oh, let's just go there. Like, give me something hard. Trinity is one of those odd ones. This is is a, a skeptical thing about Christianity. How can you believe that there is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, And you don't believe in polytheism, multiple gods. You've just said you have three gods. But Christians say, no, they're all one. (laughs) How can God be a father and then God be a son and then God be a spirit? Well, you can do that. How many of you are a brother or have a brother? You're a sibling. How many of you are a sibling? How many of you? Keep those hands up. How many of you who are a sibling are also a parent? How many of you who are a sibling, you're also a parent, you're also an aunt or uncle? How many of you who are a sibling and a parent and an aunt or an uncle are also a best friend? God was sent, God Father was center stage in the Old Testament. Let's talk about a three-act play. In the Gospels, God as Son, showing us he understands humanity, came in flesh, he was front and center on the stage. And then what's called the church age from the book of Acts in the New Testament forward into our era, God is present by his spirit. But just different roles. Does this make sense? It's a bit like water. H2O, chemical compound H2O, can be frozen, now it's ice. Can be boiled, then it's steam. Same chemical component. That's about as good as I can do. You're going to need someone smarter to get beyond that. Why are Christians so quick to judge? Judging makes us feel, no, 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 it does not make us feel better. We think judging will make us feel better about ourselves. Thank you. We think judging will make us feel better about ourselves. If I can put you down, we think, it will lift me up. It doesn't because now we're operating against God's design. And when we operate against God's design, it actually lowers us. Like, uh, if you could measure what's going on in your life, in your body, physically, chemically, in your brain chemistry, in the electrical impulses of your brain and your heart, you know, electroencephalogram for your brain, electrocardiogram for your heart, like your electrical frequencies go down when you judge. Same way it goes down when you hate. Same way it goes down when you're angry. Same way it goes down when you're jealous. Like negative emotions diminish us. They think, oh, I'm going to judge you. That, that'll make me feel better about myself. Make me feel superior to you. It does not. But the question was, why do we do it? We think it'll make us feel better. What happens to amazing... This is a great question, and I think it's a common question. What happens to amazingly good people who don't believe in God, do they go to hell? Big question. How many of you think that's a big question? It's a big question. Kind of boils down to amazingly good. Amazingly good. I've known a couple of amazingly good people in my life. I've known about some amazingly good people in my life. Let me give you their names. Mother Teresa, 
Billy Graham. Now, I'm old, so some of you are in a demographic. You're like, well, I, I don't know who either of those people are. Mother Teresa was a Catholic sister, uh, ran an organization uh, in Calcutta, India, where they would work among the leprous poor, like people with leprosy and poor. They smelled. They had rotting flesh. They weren't allowed to stay inside villages. They were discarded. And Mother Teresa and the other sisters in her order would hold their hands and bathe their bodies and bring them medicine and give them care. I'll never be that good. I'll never be that good. Mother Teresa said, I am not good enough to get to heaven without Jesus. All I know is, if she's not, I'm not. And I'm not the only one who's not. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. The other one is Billy Graham, famous preacher when I was a little boy, preached to thousands, helped people find their way to God by the thousands and thousands. He's a really good man. Lived his whole life without a scandal. I can't say that. Right? And he said, I'm not good enough to get to heaven without Jesus. Because good enough, when we say good enough, what we're doing, we're judging that based on the people around us. I mean, what is good? Well, it's what I do compared to what you do. And so the question is, if somebody is better than most, shouldn't they be able to go to heaven? But the standard is not how good am I compared to you. The standard is how good am I compared to God? Uh Uh-oh. What if the standard is perfect? Uh Uh-oh, which is why Mother Teresa and Billy Graham said, we need what Jesus did on the cross. He had to take the sin that they still had in their life. They were good, but they weren't perfect. They needed his forgiveness, and that's the way we get to heaven. Good question. Will we have ranks in heaven based on how good we are here in this world? We're really interested in this, aren't we? (laughs) Like, am I better than you? Pretty sure I'm better than the people sitting around me. Uh, Ranks in heaven. Uh, Here's what I know. The Bible does say there uh, there are rewards in heaven. And and it's it's not super definitive. Like, what's that going to look like, feel like? You know, treasures in, Jesus talks about treasures in heaven. What does that look like, feel like? In the first century when that was written, what was considered a treasure? Would we consider a treasure now? Like, ranks in heaven. Not in the way that we think of like a class system here, no. That would not be heaven. Like, better and worse levels. Higher and lower levels. That wouldn't be heaven. I think there's going to be such a beautiful equality in heaven that is so missing on earth. But will some people, like, have a sense of God's pleasure in deep ways and they'll have an understanding that God was honoring something they did on earth? Yeah, I think so. But not in a way that would make the person who doesn't get it feel like they're less than. Does this make sense? Yeah. What happens to married people when one person is saved and the other is not? Uh, are we not viewed as one? Ooh, once we're married. Ooh, I, like, I kind of like the twist on that. That's a good question. So, and I, I, here, here's one thing. The Bible says that it's really smarter for a Christian to marry a Christian so that there is spiritual compatibility. Now, have I seen happy marriages where that's not true? Yeah, I have. I, I have. But I think the question might be what happens like in heaven. That's what it kind of sounded like at the end. Like does one, since we're one, does one's relationship with Jesus help carry the other person's relationship with Jesus into heaven? I don't think so. One of the things that I think gets missed in a lot of teaching in churches is personal responsibility. And I think it's missing in our culture 
big time. Not my fault. Someone else is responsible. I was just a victim of my circumstances. Call a wambulance. Man, come on. Yeah. Most of us are in the situations we're in, and most of us are there because of choices we've made. Even if somebody inflicted something on us and we chose to stay in it, it's still we have personal responsibility. Are you with me? So I don't think my salvation is going to help anybody else have a relationship with God. They're, they're going to need to have a relationship with God through Jesus on their own. My dad was married to my mother. But I wasn't married until I made a decision to be married. My dad had a relationship with Jesus, but I didn't have a relationship with Jesus until I chose to have a relationship with Jesus. Does this make sense? It, we don't, there's not a thing called salvation by heritage. You know? But my, my uncle was a deacon. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it's just, okay, what should, what should we make of the scripture that says the skies will burn and the oceans will boil? I think, I think the end is going to be really dramatic. <laughs> I do. I, I, think, I mean, think about it. Like, what, think of the countries alone that have nuclear weapons. The capability to destroy the world by fire already exists. So is it a stretch for us to believe that the end of all things might be some big fireball? That's not a stretch there. Is evil behavior due to is the evil behavior due to mental illness still evil? Absolutely not. If it's a compulsion that they can't help, will they still be damned? Absolutely not. God hold, this is personal responsibility. God holds us responsible for what we're responsible for. Mental, I, get, I get asked this all the time. Because I have three suicide attempts under my belt, people ask me, if you had succeeded, would you have gone to hell? I don't believe so, and I'll tell you why. I don't think the choice to kill yourself is rational. I wasn't rational. I thought I was being rational. It felt rational, but it's irrational. Healthy people don't harm themselves. Healthy people have a desire to live. Healthy people will do almost anything to live. One of the strongest desires God puts in us is the desire to live. So when I'm operating against that, I now understand I wasn't thinking right. And, and therefore, in terms of God holding me responsible for irrationality, that you know, my mind was twisted back then. In a lot of ways. No, I don't think God holds us responsible for actions from mental illness. Now, society might hold you responsible. And maybe should. It's not a license just to go out. Like maybe society has to constrain harmful behavior so others are protected if a person's mentally ill, right? Like one time I was almost 50, what is it, 51, 50? Whew, this close. Like... That's if they know you've, you're going to harm yourself or someone else. I'm all for that. I'm glad it didn't happen to me, but I'm all for it for everybody else. All right? Okay. What does the Bible say about animal cruelty? I, I think, let's just take out the word animal. What does the Bible say about cruelty? Don't be. Don't be. Cruelty. Like that's... Man, I could do a whole, like, I'm already going to, so now here's what I can tell you to anticipate. Anticipate a sermon on personal responsibility and anticipate a sermon on cruelty. Like, no. Will our pets be in heaven and do animals have, and do animals have souls? That was the twist in that. Do animals have souls? Here's the thing, and I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll quit teasing here about animals. I don't see why animals, I don't think animals have souls. No, I don't think animals have souls. But I also don't think that would preclude them from being in heaven. And here, here's why. In heaven, we have other expressions of soulless creation. There are rivers in heaven. There are trees in heaven. There are many things in heaven described in the Bible that are part of creation and have brought us much joy on earth. The Bible does not speak of animals in heaven, but it doesn't. Uh, preclude the possibility that they could be in heaven. I think it would be just 
added to the joy. And so I tend to think so. Uh, I, I can't prove that. That's strictly my opinion, uh, which that and $5 will get you a small Starbucks coffee. All right. <laughs> Are ghosts real, paranormal occurrences, demons, or is that nonsense? I think there are aspects of the spiritual that we don't fully understand. I think there is a whole spiritual realm in addition to the natural realm. Give an example. A little bit different question, but it, I think it'll be uh, illustrative for you. Uh, I was, uh, you, know, you know, the loss of my brother was a big loss in my life, right? And, and I was on the phone in my kitchen with this, uh, a friend of mine, and she and I were talking, and, and I was telling her about this writing project that I was doing, and she said, you know, I think your brother would be very, very proud of you. Now, hold that thought. So I'm in my kitchen. In our kitchen, we have canned lights. You know what I mean? The recessed lighting all through, all through our kitchen. And one light has been broken the whole time we've been there. I tried to fix it. That's a joke. Uh, <laughs> I'm just not capable. Uh, we, but we had an electrician come in, and he said it's going to cost X, Y, Z. And I thought, we have eight lights. Seven's fine. And we just let it go. It never worked. So I'm talking to this person. While I'm talking to this person, she says, I think your brother's going to be proud of you. Karen is in our living room. We have a little house, so it's like just out as far as that wall and I look at her and Karen goes and so then I get off the phone and I said what and she said well what were you talking about on the phone I said well my friend Alex was talking about Jeff my brother she said well in that moment that light came on above you and shone right down on your head now what do I believe about that? Well, first of all, it's frustrating because I tried to get that darn light on <laughs> for years. My brother shows up one time. <laughs> Lived in his shadow all my life. And... <laughs> right? Does God do that? I've talked to so many people. Actually, it's a television show I'd like to produce and I, I want to call it visitations, of these kinds of stories where people have what they think are experiences with people who have passed. Now, do I think that can happen? Here's what I think, and this is in the Bible. There's a very thin veil between us and the other side. And God is responsible for what passes back and forth. A story about Abraham a rich man named Abraham and a poor man named Lazarus, and there's all this dialogue and what they can see back and forth after they had died. I mean, there's just so many experiences of this in the, in the Scriptures. So, yeah, so then you go to, like, to, I don't think ghosts necessarily, but are there parts of the spiritual realm that God sometimes allows us to see for His good reasons? Here's what I do know. If it's of God, it'll never be frightening. It'll always be comforting. That's just God. If it is that, and it's frightening, then yeah, I think that would be satanic. But there's a spiritual realm. Does this make sense? Man, I'm going way too long on these questions. I'm so sorry. How are we doing? We good? Yeah? You good? Everybody good? Ooh, look at this. Chapter 1. What does, what does God's... What does God's... Oh, what is... What does God's disposition change in the Bible? Why does God's disposition... Okay, I'm getting your question. Why does God's disposition change in the Bible? For example, this is a good question. In the Old Testament, he's an angry, punishing God. Is that because it's more about man's understanding of his relationship with God uh, and less the inspired word? I struggle with a God who has a changed nature. I've always believed God is perfect love. Therefore, I struggle with many of the messages of the Bible. That is so good. I, and I've had this you know, ask through the years. Because I, I actually, you know, it, it could be a struggle. There is a big difference between the God that you see in the Old Testament and, and who Jesus came to show us God is in the Gospels. What's the difference? I don't know that I can give a comprehensive answer that's satisfying. 
here is how I've come to it in my own mind. And you're probably going to say, well, Brad, your mind's not very deep. We knew that. <laughs> so, all right? I'm wearing an ice cream man's uniform for Pete's sake. Come on. Come on. So in the, in the Old Testament, I feel like God showed us how severely he judges sin. How, how holiness is repulsed by anything unholy. I think that's what we see in the Old Testament. Is that God's like all these people and all they're doing and I have had enough of it and he just cannot, holiness cannot have a relationship with unholiness. That's what I think a lot of the Old Testament teaches me. Which to me is a setup for God stepping in in the Gospels, the story of Jesus, saying, I can't tolerate sin, but I love people. So what am I going to do about it? I have to have a way to forgive them. So this question is, is God inconsistent? Stick with me. He's very consistent. In the Old Testament, people were punished for their sin. Because God's holiness and his justice demands that sin be punished. In the New Testament, God's holiness demands a penalty to satisfy his justice. And he puts that all on his son, Jesus. So in the Old Testament, it was on people. In Jesus, it's on, in the New Testament, it's on Jesus. But same God consistently punishing sin and showing us he wants to have a relationship with us. That's about as good as I can do on that one. Are there any places in the Bible that can teach how to be strong mentally and patient? If so, where do I look? Y yeah, there actually are. There are. Here's what I would ask you to do. Just And just... He, one of your best resources for Bible study is the Googler. <laughs> go to the Googler. Say, hey, Google. Hey, Siri. <laughs> Watch all your phones go, what, what, what? <laughs> Give me all the verses in the Bible that have the word patience. There's a lot. And just read those. There's a lot. Here's what you're going to find, though. I used to say this. If you pray for patience, duck. Because there's only one way to get patience. Patience. To be put in a situation where patience is required. So if you want patience, you said you did, it has to be developed. That's like going to the gym. And, and to build that patience muscle, you're going to have to learn endurance. And there's a, a, an old word, Lloyd, you'll like this, King James, long-suffering. <laughs> you're going to have some long-suffering. But the end of that will be patience. Now, we talk about patience. Here's another Old Testament, New Testament change. Old Testament, written in Hebrew, uh, the word means uh, endurance. Endurance. We talk about the patience of Job. You read that story, there wasn't a patient minute in his life. He's screaming at God. He's throwing things at heaven. It didn't look patient at all. But what did he do? He didn't quit. He didn't give up his faith. He didn't abandon a relationship with God. He was just mad at God. He got to the end, though, because he endured. That's a better picture. What we think patience is, oh, I'll just sit here and take it and not have any feelings about it. That's weak. It's more of, I have a lot of feelings about it, but I don't quit. That's really the essence of patience. Does that make sense? Everybody? Yep. Why did, so many, why did so many pastors fail during COVID crisis? This is an interesting question because failed pastors has been of particular interest to me uh, in my life. Uh, I don't know that there was any more that happened during COVID. I, there were some prominent ones that happened during COVID. Here's what somebody told me when I was going through my mess. He said, Brad, thank God that it's so rare that it still warrants front page news. It, like the reason it seems like, oh gosh, every, no really, it's just very rare. Like I'll give you an example. 
Uh, I used to be Southern Baptist. I'm now in recovery. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm, 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 I'm better than that now. But um, Southern Baptists alone have 40,000 pastors. So then how many Methodist pastors are there? How many Assembly of God pastors are there? How many non-denominational? I mean, there's millions of pastors. And, and, you know, as, as I'm trying to think, I mean, I, I think of a couple of Hillsong guys and a couple, maybe like two, like maybe there might have been four pastors out of millions that made the news. It's still rare. It's super tragic. It's super tragic. But I do think it's rare. Most shut down their churches in fear and obedience to big government and instead of doing what was right to feed the sheep. Hmm. I don't want to get down too political of a, of a road. Like, feeding the sheep and protecting the sheep about a disease that we didn't know much about and in an abundance of caution, some churches... Like, we met in the parking lot because this building is in Los Angeles County. You go a half a mile north or just right down a Gura Road, you're in Ventura County, and they, they weren't quite as, like, uptight in Ventura County. L.A. County was very tight, so they said no can't meet inside this building. So some of you were here then. We, we met in the parking lot for a year. I got all kinds of crap for that. Weak, won't stand up. Stand up to you, come on. <laughs> I didn't do that. Didn't do that. Uh, part of being a shepherd, is, is, is it standing up to government or is it really in your heart trying to do what you think is best for your people? I thought that was best for our people. Right or wrong, judge me or not, I, I don't care. I actually don't need your approval. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> you want to see me stand up? I just did. All right. <clears throat> Lord's Prayer. We recite Matthew 6, 12. Forgive us trespasses, but the Bible says debts. Did the translators change this? Yes, yes, yes. So this is very cool about Bible translation. Um, in the best translation of the Bible, there's about 7,000 words. But in the English translations, no, no, no. In the Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, the languages of the Bible, about 7,000 words. In the best translations of the Bible, 12,000 words. Just a lot of words. Like, I'll give you an example. Patience. Patience. A better word is endurance. You're going to find that in different translations. Does it change the meaning or the truth? No. I don't think any of our you know, most common translations have at all interfered with the truthful message of how to have a relationship with God through Christ. I don't think that's been altered. How do you explain to a non-believer why God allows so much grief, loss, and pain in people's lives? I think the problem of suffering is, is probably the number one reason People have a hard time believing in God, the evil in the world. This is going to sound trite. I don't mean it to. I actually think there's some depth to this if you'll sit with it. When we ask God, why do you allow so much suffering in the world? Here's what I think he says to us. Why do you? I mean, personal responsibility. Like, aren't we to be working for justice? Aren't we to be working for human rights? Aren't we to be finding the weak and the broken and the fallen and being the ones who extend love? Like, so, we want this, we, we just want someone to come in and just rescue. And God's like, well, then I, I wouldn't need you. <laughs> like, we're the answer. Does this make sense? Well, Brad, what, what can I do about you know, the war between nations. Well, maybe not a lot globally. How about the war in your family? How about make peace with the people you're in conflict with? Why isn't there more love in the world? Well, how about you be more loving? If, you, if one person is more loving, wouldn't there be more love in the world? It'd be tiny. But if hundreds of us were more loving, wouldn't there be more, loving in, more love in this room? And then you just multiply that out. So we're the change. We're the change. 
I, I, I think God sometimes says, you get, in, in all love, you get out there and, and do it. All right. Is it only one time a year to be baptized at Cal Church? Or can we request it at any time? Yes, you can request it at any time. And we probably baptize about four times a year. And actually, we're probably due for one. How do you explain to your child when they ask how God exists without a mom or dad? <laughs> Talking to children about God is just some of the most fun times I've ever had in my life. I don't know a good answer to that other than God has always been. Somebody, sweetheart, had to be first. And the first one then made all the mommies and daddies. And by the time you bore them with that, they'll be on to the next question. So, <clears throat> Does the church believe in eternal security? Oh, there's a Southern Baptist in the room. Once saved, always saved. If ever you're born again, you sin without repentance, so you go to hell. I do believe in security of the believer. Which means, for those of you who don't know this phrase, once you turn your life over to Jesus, ask for his forgiveness, ask him to fill you and lead you, be your savior, the forgiver of your sin, and your Lord, the leader of your life. Once you've made that transaction with him, I believe he holds us in that relationship. Well, well but what if you sin? Well, you were a sinner when he took hold of you. There's not going to be a time in your life where you aren't falling short, right? It wasn't up to you to be saved in the first place. It was all up to his grace, and it's his grace that holds you. John chapter 10, Jesus said, you're in my Father's hand. Nothing can take you out. I hold on to that because he holds on to me. If someone dies overdosing, well, again, I think that goes to the, the mental illness thing. Uh, are there opportunities to volunteer in our community uh, through our church to help others? Yes, yes, yes. Donna, would you, and Ed and Lisa, right here. So Ed and Lisa and Donna, uh, Mission Outreach, Compassion uh, Ministries, right there. They'll, they'd love to talk to you. Does God hear all of our all the prayers about illness and when, I, and when will I get over this handicap? God hears all of our prayers. I think God answers all of our prayers. But it's one of three answers. See, when we say to God, well, God didn't answer my prayer. Hold on. He didn't give you the answer you wanted. Because his answer was probably no. <laughs> or it was not yet. Do you know how many people are praying for my brother? Thousands of people around the world were praying for my brother to be healed, and he died. Now, what was God's answer to the prayer? He healed my brother. If we believe what we believe, per oh, 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 I see, you wanted him healed temporarily. So that then he'd get sick again and suffer more and eventually still die. That could have been an answer. Extend his life on earth. That's a different prayer. But we prayed for God to heal him. And now he's perfect in heaven. And once again, I live in the shadow of a perfect older brother. So there we go. Just goes back to that, doesn't it, Jeff? Go ahead. Turn the lights out. I don't care. Bible passages to get through prolonged illness. Go to the Googler and say, Bible, all the verses in the Bible for comfort. All the verses in the Bible for discouragement. All the verses in the Bible for sadness. Are you with me? No, oh, I got I to end. I'm sorry. Gosh, I'm so sorry. Look at this. I didn't get through half. I am so, I don't know what to do about that. Next week. How many of you would come back if I did it next week? See, that's not everybody. So I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I guess you're going to have to find out what I do. 